Hello, everybody. Welcome to this um, eighth lecture on uh, hermeneutics. And of course, now we're moved into the phase now of um, really applying our rules or and, and um, doing our Bible study and our research. And right now, up to this point, basically, let's look at where we're at. Um, where we're at is we have taken our verse of scripture in Acts chapter um, 8. And let's just go over there real quickly. And I want everybody to know that's taking this class um, for, um, for school and that is in Bible school, that you are responsible at this juncture for doing all of your categories and putting, starting to put your conclusions together. I'm not doing it for you because that's the test. You know, that's what your that's your assignment. That's what you're going to be held responsible for. In the end um, of these lecture series for everybody else that is following along, I'm going to be posting th those conclusions. And, um, of course, even if you're not taking this class uh, for a grade, uh, this is something that you ought to be doing as well if you truly want to benefit the most uh, from understanding how to, uh, you know, apply these rules and benefit the most from um, the, the these lecture series on hermeneutics because it's something you're supposed to be doing every day for the rest of your life. So this isn't just something that you're going to do in, in, in one time and it's basically over. Once again, you're learning how to study the Bible. There's nothing more important than this. And so we've, we're have we looking at Acts chapter 8, verse 15, and we're dealing with a whole lot of doctrinal issues that are undertones here so we read who when they were come down prayed for them that they might receive the holy ghost and so the first thing that we have done here is we've done research on the holy ghost <clears throat> in other words everywhere the holy ghost is found we've collected the information on that we've categorized it as to <clears throat> either an attribute of the holy ghost or an action of the holy ghost and, of course, one of the most important things for us is the activity of the Holy Ghost with respect to salvation. Because one of our questions is, is this. Were, the, were those uh, folks in Samaria that responded to the altar call that Philip gave, who believed on the name of Jesus and were baptized, were they saved? And, of course... Most everybody's going to say, well, of course they were saved. But what we have to understand is there is a specific issue that comes to bear. And that specific issue is that they had not yet received the Holy Ghost. And this is where it becomes challenging for a lot of various different um, concepts of doctrine within the framework of uh, the church today. Because it's important to recognize that when you're born of the Spirit at the new birth, you receive the Holy Ghost. But yet there's also this action of where we are empowered by the Holy Ghost. And so that's why it's so important to get your category set to forth on the Holy Ghost in terms of actions or versus attributes and a couple of other categories that I gave you hint to. And those categories kind of fall out as you're looking through all these verses of Scripture. And then understanding that you also need to think about the synonyms um, for the Holy Ghost, which would simply be the Spirit, the Spirit of the Lord, the Spirit of God. Um, and then, you know, the focus is in the New Testament. But, of course, we learn a whole lot about the um, actions and activities of the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of the Lord, the Spirit of God from the Old Testament as well. And um, so then the next thing we did was we looked at the word salvation. And once again, here, as you begin to go through this, you understand that when you're looking at the word salvation, you're, you're dealing with um, save, deliverance, the new birth, begotten of God, um, born of the Spirit, <clears throat> so there, there's where you get some overlap with salvation, and you begin to flesh out that much more 
really in respect to what the the Holy Ghost assignment, what the Spirit of the Lord's assignment is within respect with respect to salvation. And of course, as you've been doing this uh, this assignment with salvation, the most important thing to notice, although you have a lot of scriptures to cover when you're dealing with save, and 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 of course, remember last week I showed you a our last lecture. I showed you a unique way and a very important way to search these words in the New Testament, and that was to actually use the Greek word zotso, and zotso meaning um, to be to be made whole. Um, it, it contains both salvation and healing and deliverance, and all the activity of this grace of God that frees us from something that was imposed or afflicted upon us and brings us out of that realm of sin, sickness, and disease, whatever it may be that's opposed to God, and brings us into the realm of God and, and the benefits that are there in God. And what's so important to recognize about salvation is that as you go through all of these words, saved, salvation, delivered, uh, born again, begotten of God, new creation, new creature, everything that's saying the same thing over and again, but in a different way, it's important to look at the big picture of salvation as you're categorizing this and then utilize the wealth of information that we have about salvation to understand maybe more obscure verses of scripture that you would have to deal with less uh, that are like, lest a man lose his life, uh, he shall not find it. If you, if you preserve your life, you shall lose it. And really trying to understand what the Lord is saying within the framework of maybe more complicated verses of scripture that you have to lose your life to find it. And if you hold on to your life, you're going to lose it. Well, when I look at the beauty of salvation and how simple the Lord made it, and as we were pointing out to you last lecture, and as we're going to make it even more apparent to you when we actually begin in the final uh, lectures to reveal to you these categories and show you how I broke them out uh, in terms of the various different attributes of salvation, um, those things that are plainly stated, like anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, how you know, simple is that? And then help you understand some of the more, as I was saying, hard to understand uh, verses of scripture about salvation in which people can really begin to get bogged down and get into formulas and rituals and ultimately find themselves, you know, uncertain about their salvation. Well, you know, once again, when you go through and you look at all that God has said and the whole counsel of God, and then the majority of the verses of scripture on how simple salvation it is, one thing that you begin to conclude real quickly is certainly those at Samaria were saved and certainly those at Samaria were not only saved, but they had received the spirit of the Lord. They had received the Holy Spirit, but it is it's very simply at that moment in time, time more perfectly and obviously contrasted from the gift of the Holy Ghost that now is uh, being um, imparted to them and received as the apostles Peter and John come down to Samaria and minister to those at Samaria. Okay, and so, um, you know, I will show you those, that information. I'm sure you have it there. Uh, as I said, towards the end, I'll show you the conclusions that I have towards the end. And then we'll go through the checklist and we'll make sure that those conclusions were actually derived from following all of the rules. In other words, we're not going to make a co conclusion on one verse of scripture. There's got to be two or three witnesses. And those two or three witnesses have to be, have the same context the same context. I will prove to you that when we use these two or three verses of scripture, and in, in many instances, it's far more than two or three verses of scripture. And I mean, I've seen places where there's, you know, 20 to 30 verses of scripture and having the same context. And, and, and you know, I really love to say this. I, I love to say, if you want to see the work of grace and the work of salvation and exactly what God has intended for our lives and and what he's purposed for us to really get and to do, then understand it, it's going to be modeled and revealed in the life of Jesus. 
And then it's going to be also seen and reproduced in the life of the apostles. It's going to be preached by the apostles. And you're going to see the action and the activity of it ministered in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ as it is recorded um, in the ministry uh, in the epistles. Okay, so moving right along, because I don't have time to take you right now through all of my analysis on salvation, um, what we want to do is we want to really dig into two more topics. One is baptized, and the other is the phrase, believe on the name of Jesus Christ, because that, that, that phrase is very important to us because it's going to help solidify what is essential for salvation? What do you need to do in, in order to be to receive the miracle of salvation, to the, be the beneficiary of the grace of God that has brought salvation? And so, what I want to do in, in this lecture is I would I'm, I want us to to focus on baptism, and um, then we're going to look at a couple of things about baptize and understand that this is a, a, work, a word that it's very important to re for us to recognize context. And for example, exactly what do I mean by recognizing context? <clears throat> Excuse me. Because the Bible talks really primarily about three different baptisms. There's the baptism in water, there's the baptism into the Lord Jesus Christ or the body of Christ. And then there is the baptism into the Holy Spirit. And so it's going to be very important for us to look at contacts and then properly categorize them and then also begin to ask ourselves questions about baptism. And remember, uh, one of the things that you've already done is to contrast and compare uh, what took place um, in, in the... Um, in the three different salvation events. And before I go to baptism, and I because I know last time I just started hitting, hinting on co contrasting and comparing the salvation events, I want to begin there and just once again, real quickly run through that for you because it, it's important that we understand what is the breadth or, uh, or, the, um, or the strictness, if you would, of the way salvation takes place. And some people call it a salvation formula. Some people call it a baptism formula. Well, the question is, when we look at the four salvation events in the book of Acts, how much divergency is there? How much similarity is there? And so before I go into baptism, I'm going to start briefly here with contrasting and comparing the salvation events. And I'm just going to give you some hints. I think that you need to diagram this a little bit more. You need to break it out into categories of, of, of elements of the things that belong to a salvation, like calling upon the name of the Lord Jesus, being baptized in water, you know, and receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost. And recognizing that the gift of the Holy Ghost is, is I've already hinted at this, when you begin to run that down, there's a bit of difference between the gift of the Holy Spirit and salvation, and the gift of, of salvation. And then there is also, it's, it's very difficult to discern a difference between the two. And, um, and, and there's reasons for that. I really believe there's reasons for that. And so let me just get into this real quickly and, and take you over to Acts chapter 2 quickly. And let's just look at what, Paul, what Peter is saying there on the day of Pentecost. And, you know, of course, everybody wants to come up with these questions that, you know, like were the disciples saved before Pentecost and things in, uh, of that nature. I, I want to just hold off on that and just recognize that Pentecost, boy, were they, did they ever get the full package, okay? And maybe some of the what I'm saying, they're also kind of be fleshed out a little bit more as we contrast and compare. But here's what Peter says that that people need to do and that simply they need to repent they need to be baptized everyone in the name of jesus christ so what is the category there for baptism and though we're jumping ahead a little bit still it's a good time to collect that information and there's going to be a whole lot more to collect on baptism but we understand they're, they're to be baptized in the name of jesus christ for the remission of sins 
Now, understand this, okay? It's very important that you don't get lost here in just the uh, co the collection of, of words because we know that it is the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses us from all sin, and so there's actually more that we need to be doing with the concept of remission of sins. We just know that this obedience ultimately to what Christ Jesus did for us at Calvary and the blood of redemption that has been supplied to us, the blood of the covenant, is all being implied here as you as you take these steps of obedience before the Lord. And we know all, already that the, in the Great Commission, the Lord Jesus Christ sent the disciples to baptize in the, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And that's not a separate tradition because, once again, if that is a separate tradition, then we're violating the rules of hermeneutics as I've proven to you the Bible expresses the rules. We know that there's one author, and he the one author is God, and he's used many different servants, holy men of old, okay? And so... What we see here is that it isn't a separate tradition. It's just that now Peter is emphasizing the person Christ Jesus. It doesn't do away with anything that has already been, um, has already had a precedence set. And so we can talk more about the um, applying the hermeneutical rules of uh, to baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost as it was delivered to us by Christ Jesus. Um, but we're not going to do that right now. We might do that if we have time when we begin to go through uh, the subject of baptism. Okay, so it just makes it really simple. He says, he says, repent, believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you should, and you should receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And so you could say, well, it happened just like this. First, you repent, okay, uh, you're baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of sin, um, and then you receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. But then one of the questions that you might ask is, well, where do you call upon the name of the Lord? Because uh, Paul said in Acts chapter uh, uh, 16, verse 31, he gave the formula, if you would, to the jailer who said, what must I do to be saved? And Paul said, believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved in your house. So he just makes it there. He just, it just summarizes it. He just summarizes it. He, you know, that's not the only place that it's just summarized. I mean, uh, Paul also summarized in Romans chapter 10, verses, you know, 10, 9, and 10. And he said, you know, if you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, he said, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Okay, so once again, we're looking at it, somebody says, said, might say a different salvation formula. No, we're not. We're looking at a summary that we must understand in the context of the whole of what the scripture says about salvation, the gift of the Holy Ghost, and, 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 you know, and what it means to be saved. And so what we're doing is we're looking at the application of salvation in, in basically four or five different communities here, but we're certainly not taking into perspective the, the whole of the voice in the New Testament on how easy salvation comes in, into our lives, of how easy it is to be saved, of how ready God stands to save us, and the authority of salvation being the name of Jesus Christ, calling upon that name. I mean, you know, it starts right off in John. Once again, you look at... You know, and you might even actually even say another salvation formula that that is given to us right there in John chapter one. He just simply says, and he says, everyone who received him, he gave authority to be the sons of God, as many as would believe upon his name. Well, there's another salvation formula. Here it is, just simply receiving this wonderful gift. What he's doing? Look at the look at the formula. For example, that the, if you're when we're calling it a formula, just take that soft in a soft way, okay? But look at what Jesus says to the woman at the well concerning salvation in John chapter four. Once again, starting like for example at verse fourteen, look at that salvation formula. It's very important that we take in all this information and we build on it. Look at how easy. Jesus Jesus made salvation. And, you know, there he doesn't even have a baptism formula in this. And so when people begin to extract one verse of scripture here, one verse of scripture there, and they begin to make a doctrine out of it, 
it's time to hold up. It's, I mean, I know that there have been many great men and, and women of God who've done wonderful things and love the Lord Jesus with all of their heart, but reality of it is they do not have one verse of scripture in the Bible, and everything that anyone preaches, everyone, it must be observed and it must be concluded by all that it is clearly what God is saying. And one of the things that all of us know about the Bible is that the Lord is very redundant in getting the point across to us. It's not it's not abstract at all. He's very redundant. He says it over and over again. And one of the things that I love to say is that the Bible is simply a book of redemption from Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22-21. It truly is a book of redemption. And so look at what Jesus says to the woman at the well. He makes it very, very simple. He said, if you just recognize who I am, he said, if you knew who was talking to you and the gift that God has, you would ask for me and I would give you to drink. Look at that salvation formula. The only water is there is the, you know, the water that Jesus is talking about giving the woman to drink. And he says immediately, he says, upon doing this, he tells her very clearly that you will have a wellspring, and that wellspring has a lot of overtones from the Old Testament because that clearly has that description of salvation, the new covenant, the final covenant that would come to pass in the days of the Messiah. Here it is, a Samaritan woman is being addressed, and look at how easy salvation is. Recognize who I am, Jesus is saying. Recognize I'm the Savior, I'm the Messiah, I'm the giver of this gift, and the gift that God has for you and I will give you to drink. He said something very similar when he cried out in um, John chapter 7 later on. Look at that salvation formula, okay? That salvation formula is he said he stands up at the great day of the fe feast, and he, which is the Feast of Tabernacles, and he says, it's any man's thirsty, once again come unto me, and I shall give you to drink, and out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. This spake he of the Holy Ghost, which was not yet given, for he had not yet been glorified. Once again, there's a great Great place for you to apply the laws and the rules of hermeneutics to understand what does it mean to receive the Holy, that the Holy Ghost was not yet given until he was glorified. What is the glorification of the Lord Jesus Christ? How is that different from his death, his burial, his resurrection? And, and, and then understand you'll find the glorification within the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ when he sat down at the right hand of the Father, the majesty on high. So there's a lot of pieces that are coming together. And to so, try to then lock these things down into one verse of scripture, and to one idea based upon just something that, you know, seems to be, you know, you know a, a isolated comment on maybe a one of the salvation formulas, as, as it were, that Paul gave, or one of the salvation formulas that Peter gave. Well, that's unwise, because once again, we're not looking at different traditions. Once again, we're not looking at different authors. We are looking at the whole counsel of God, and we need to back up, and we need to get a vista view, a heavenly view, and, and, and see the bigger picture instead of being lost in the woods because of the trees, because of details that we're getting ourselves stuck in in the realms of semantics, okay? So, one, you know, and I, I hopefully that while I'm saying this, that I'm really seeding you to look at all of the different ways in which you know, salvation and how to be saved is expressed in the Bible, categorize them, and don't say it's got to be done this one way, because one of the things for certain that you're going to see is that when we're just, when we're sitting here looking at these different salvation formulas, and it's going to be the same way with baptism, baptism formulas, you're not going to find it locked down in just some step one, step two, step three, step four. You're not going to hear it said over and over again exactly the same way. It's just not going to be done that way. It isn't done that way. And um, so, you know, you have to then see a bigger picture of what's being said because it's not contradictions at all. It's rather simply the Lord expressing to us the, the, the breath of that which then happens and is experienced within the context of this wonderful gift that God has supplied to us. You know, one of the things I love to remind people of, and of course there was only one thief beside Jesus on the cross, but nonetheless, look at that salvation formula. You know, it all, come on, and these all of this information has to be taken in 
to the whole of our analysis before we go jumping to conclusions if we're really truly going to live by the laws of hermeneutics. You know, but what did the thief do? He just simply said, you know, he just recognized who Jesus was. He said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He recognized that he was the king. He recognized in what he said that Jesus was the Messiah. There's a lot of undertones in the simple phrase that is used concerning the thief on the cross. But the bottom line of it is Jesus said this day you'll be with me in paradise. Okay, so what a, what a wonderful expression of what salvation means. And of course, I don't want to go into breaking down every word as we go through them. Otherwise, we're never going to get through what we're talking about right now. Seating you to look at all of the various different ways, okay, that, uh, that things go down. And, and for example, when we get to baptism, I'm going to show you. Paul said, I didn't, bat I didn't, go, I didn't go preaching baptism. He said, in fact, I don't know if I baptized any of you except for Coley and a few others, okay? And so that should bring people into check right there that's got these various different rigid baptismal formulas. Hold up, okay? And that you're saved by baptism. We're not saved by baptism. And uh, we're saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. We're saved by the power of the resurrection. We're saved by calling upon the name of the Lord. And then there is obedience to this. And then it doesn't have to be done in one way or the other. But what we're going to see is we're going to see all the elements of these things are, you know, communicated in salvation, but it's not good. we're not going to see them happening step one, step two, step three, step four. So, for example, let's go quickly over to Acts chapter 8 and, and verse 37. And, you know, Philip's talking to the eunuch, and of course, you know, I've already mentioned this a couple of times, but it's still so very, very important. You know, we know, we don't have it, that dialogue of what Philip was telling the eunuch about being saved and being baptized in water, but we definitely know for sure that he was because, the you know, Philip seems like he's just talking to the eunuch really about Isaiah and breaking Isaiah down, and then the eunuch responds, um, as he says to Philip and Philip, as he says, as the eunuch says, what hinders me to be baptized? And, and so we know that that is a very important point. We know the category or the subject or topic is water baptism. And Philip says, if you believe with all your heart, you may be, you may, you may be baptized. Okay. So Philip's formula here, it's not a formula, but as it, it was actually seen earlier in Acts chapter eight was they called upon the name of the Lord Jesus. They were saved. The miracle of salvation was there, just as the miracle of the gifts of healing was there. The work and the activity of the Holy Ghost is provable. It was there. And so he's saying the same exact thing, really, that he's already previously said, and that is this, that believe upon that repent, really, which is the same thing that Peter has said, repent or believe with all of your heart uh, on the Lord Jesus Christ and, uh, and what has been and what has been you know, provided here, and 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 you may. And he answered, said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And so there we, we get a little expansion of what Philip is saying when he's saying, believe with all your heart, okay? Well, you know, Peter's expression of believe with all the heart in some degree is repent, okay? And here now, uh, the, the, the eunuch is responding appropriately to Philip, helping us to more clearly understand what he understood Philip to tell him. And he said, I believe in the name, I believe on G, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Understand that is very, very important. It is absolutely essential. Okay? And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water. We know exactly what's going on here, and we'll come back to this later, but he's being baptized in water. It's not about being baptized in the body of Christ, it's not being about, about being baptized in the Holy Ghost. And so we see him being baptized in water, and when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away. Okay, wow, powerful translation. So, and the, and the eunuch went away rejoicing. <clears throat> now, it doesn't say anything about that next step that was taken uh, previously or that we saw taken previously when John and Peter came down and laid their hands on the Samaritans and they received the gift of the Holy Ghost. They were baptized in the, what we would call, refer to as being baptized in the Holy Ghost or the Holy Ghost falling upon them, which we also already given have given you a category to search out because we showed you that if the Holy Ghost falls upon you, it's the same as the, as the Holy Ghost uh, 
having uh, filled the place or to, or, or to, uh, it's the same as uh, the Holy Ghost having fell upon them or have falling upon them or having been filled with the Holy Ghost or having been baptized the Holy Ghost. We show that all of those are synonyms, okay? So you have to go back to a, uh, a previous lecture. And those are different words saying exactly the same thing, okay? And very, very important, okay? That you get that because there's really some strange and odd concepts going on. What it means to be filled with the Spirit versus baptized with the Holy Spirit. What does it mean when the Holy Ghost falls on you versus being baptized? Uh, what it means for the Holy Ghost to fall upon you rather than being filled. And, you know, Acts chapter 2 has already cleared that up just by itself. But there's, of course, more verses of Scripture that help us to understand that even that, that much more that much more clearly okay so um once again look salvation is complete doing what calling upon the name of the lord jesus believing that jesus christ is the son of god so many different ways to say it and then baptism to, is, is subsequent so the, those two things are are common right now right so what peter said basically um in Acts chapter 2 is basically what philip said what he preached or previously in Acts chapter 8 and now what he said later here later on here in Acts chapter 8 when dealing with the eunuch. And then you have to ask yourself, you say, ah, there's the formula. There it is. Okay, we got it now. We understand exactly how this thing has got to work. And then, lo and behold, you turn over to Acts chapter 10 and verse 44, and it just blows up on your face, okay? Now, all of a sudden, you're maybe just as confused about a salvation formula as what you might have been trying to justify concerning what Jesus said about what you need to do uh, in order to be saved. I mean, you know, if everybody started doing their all altar calls like Jesus does altar calls, <laughs> like Jesus did altar calls. He, you know, he went about commanding people to repent, you know. <laughs> I mean, his altar calls were set up in a very different way. But nonetheless, let's go to Acts 10, 44. And this scripture says, now while Peter was still speaking the word, just saying, you know, talking about how that, you know, uh, you know who Jesus was and, and how that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power, you know, just preaching, you know, uh, just telling him the basics of who Jesus was and what he did. And um, while Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on them. Okay, that is actually the exact same word as I think I've already showed you as we find back there in Acts chapter um, 8 and verse 16 or in verse 15 through 17 that the Holy Ghost had not yet fallen on them the Holy Ghost fell on them okay so it's exactly the same thing now let's look at the results of what happens when the Holy Ghost fell on them and when they heard the word and so now this is going to go into more details than what happened with those folks over there in Samaria uh, because uh, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't go into the details of the expressions of the Holy Ghost there. It focuses rather on some other things. But one of the things that should stand out to you real quickly is that, number one, they haven't, quote, unquote, called upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, they have not officially in any way, uh, as apparent in the text, repented, okay, um, and they have not been baptized in water, but here now they're getting first what the Samaritans got last. Are you getting this? They got first what the Samaritans got last. Are you listening to me? And this actually sounds a whole lot more in many respects than uh, like what Jesus was saying in um, John chapter 7 uh, verses, you know, 38 through 39. And which, of course, then is also picked up at the end of the Bible in, in Revelation, uh, when once again the Spirit and the Bride uh, are all saying, and everyone who has uh, taken a drink of this water says, "Come and drink of the waters of life." So it's almost the same thing because you're now seeing that as the word is going forth, as it were, they're drinking this in and they're believing what's being said. The Holy Ghost goes to work as Peter speaks the word and you see rivers beginning to flow out of them. They're receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost, which had not yet been given. And so here we, now, now there's a, now here we are in this, you know, uh, perplexed state of Peter and there, and there are reasons for this. There's, there's certainly reasons for this because they were certainly having troubles with Samaritans being saved. They were having troubles with the Gentiles being saved. I mean, this is a gift for Israel, although Jesus had talked to them about it. Do they really get this? 
because you can understand now Peter's got to go and make an argument for Cornelius's house, these Gentiles, these Romans, you know, the centurion and, you know, and this, and this Roman soldier in his household um, receiving not only the gift of salvation, but receiving the baptism in the Holy Ghost, just like the apostles had received it. I mean, this is radical, okay? So, you know, you could say you might have some explanations for why certain things are focused on or why God did things certain ways. I mean, don't try to, you know, get locked down and trying to figure out why God does things the way he does because, you know, much of that is left to his own discretion. It belongs to him. And if you're going to try to figure all of that out, I mean, promise you, you know, you're not going to, you're not going to get very far. But the bottom, and so people try to come in here and they try to explain, well, why did this happen? Why is this being emphasized? You know, it's just reality of it is, it, these, it can happen this way or that way. It's all going to happen around the central figure, Christ Jesus, the Redeemer, the Messiah, what he did for us when he died at Calvary's cross, what he did for us when he raised, when he was buried, went down into hell, raised up the third day, ascended up on high, received the gift of the Holy Ghost, sent it from the Father. I mean, come on. But the reality of it is they're in, within the framework of the ministry of the gospel. These things can happen in different ways because now what, Paul, what Peter's going to say He's going to say, look, that, you know, that he say, he say, he says to them, to the, to those that were uh, of, of Israel, of the first covenant of circumcision, however you want to say it, those who had come, made a transition from the first covenant to the final covenant, he said, they were astonished. And he says, and they, that, that the Gentiles on the Gentiles was also poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. So understanding the gift of the Holy Ghost is equated to the Holy Ghost falling upon them is equated to the expression of the Holy Ghost in the language of the Spirit, which he then going, goes on to equates also to the exact same thing that happened to them on the day of Pentecost. So we understand that Pentecost is still ongoing. It's not limited to a day. You don't have to wait for the next Passover to come around again and then count 50 days. And now everybody is going to have an opportunity and a chance to receive again this wonderful blessing because the Holy Ghost has come and he's come to stay and this is his work. This is what he's doing. This is his work. Isn't that great? And so now he says, he said, look, these guys have received the Holy Ghost. What, why should we hold back or forbid the waters of baptism? And so he says, for they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then said Peter, can anybody forbid water that they should be baptized? So we understand exactly what is being said. Here we got folks first being baptized in the Holy Ghost before they're ever even baptized in water. So that totally blows out of the water any formula that you're going to lock down. And then you say, well, is, is, there, is there another example? This is so radical. Is there another example? And of course, there's many more things to say about this passage of scripture, but I'm running out of time. And so for the sake of time, we're just going to move on. And we're going we're gonna to look at real quickly Acts chapter 19 and, and, and verse 6. So turn in your Bibles or put it in your search engine. And right now you should be putting in your search engine. And, and let me remind you, and especially if you're just looking, uh, seeing or uh, watching this lecture uh, for the first time, don't forget you've got to go back and get the other lectures because we're building on this. And if you're using Greek words, Using a search engine, using one of these Bible programs makes it really easy. It makes searching a word more specific when you use the Greek word, the original word, or the Hebrew word, whichever the case may be. Um, it makes it more specific to understand all the scriptures that truly deal with that specific word. And then it helps you then to break out more specific and, and more broad sometimes uh, synonyms that are associated with that word. So don't forget about that. It's very, very important. Okay, so we go to Acts chapter 19, verse 6. And uh, so what happens is, you know, the story uh, here is Paul sees these disciples when he's at Ephesus and um, he recognizes them as disciples. He, in, in you know, in, in some respects, you might even say it's like he's mistaking them for disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. And and so he says to them, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? Now, he's specifically addressing something here. And we know that he's not just addressing salvation. And, and hopefully that's becoming that much more apparent. And he says to them, 
We have not so much as heard that there was any Holy Ghost. And so he says to them, under what were you baptized in? No, and Bert, you could just stop here and, and, and I'm gonna say this again. Let's look at the salvation formula as it took place with, with Paul. I mean, just look at his own testimony. Okay, he has an encounter with the Lord Jesus. Uh, he goes blind, okay, in his encounter with the Lord Jesus. That encounter certainly and most definitely results in him repenting. It certainly most definitely results in him believing that Jesus is the Son of God. It certainly and most definitely results in him believing upon the name of the Lord Jesus, okay? And then what happens? He goes to Ananias' house. He's baptized in water. And then after that, he receives the gift of the Holy Ghost. And somebody says, at what point he was saved? Well, he was saved at the same point that the Samaritans were saved. And that's what we're really wanting to get out of here. We're really wanting to flesh these things out. We're wanting to look at these actual communities as they receive salvation, understand the breadth of the possibilities of how this goes takes place, understanding that all of the elements are there, but it doesn't have to happen step one, step two, step three. It can happen step three, step two, step one. It can happen step three, step one, step two, uh, you know, uh, but, you know, uh, it, th that is simply what the scripture is presenting for us. And so there's really no arguing with it. He said unto them, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And so somebody said, well, he should have certainly said, have, haven't you believed upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ? And so that's why I say, obviously he mistook these disciples for those who had already uh, been born again and who, had already, who were disciples of Jesus. And, and they said, we did not even know that there was such a Holy Ghost. And at this point in time, now he says, well, then how were you baptized? Okay, hey, check this out. How were you baptized? Okay, Paul's interested in that subject. We'll talk a little bit more about it later. How were you baptized? They said, we were baptized under John's baptism. Ah, so now he gets more clearly, he more clearly understands who these guys are and what's going on in their life. And so he then says, well, remember what John said, he baptized repentance saying there's to the people, there's one coming after me whose name is Jesus Christ, okay? And that that's the one you're supposed to believe on. And so at this point in time, now what is he doing? He's bringing them as it were back into this salvation formula. And he's saying, he backs them all the way up. First of all, he says, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? He finds out that, wait a, minute, wait a minute, they don't even know anything about the Holy Ghost. So he backs them all the way up. He brings them to Christ Jesus. And when they heard that, that when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Once again, there's a commonality with what Peter said um, and, and, and what we might infer is being said by Philip. And, but once again, when you're baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, it is somehow exclude the Holy Ghost and the Father. No, the Holy Ghost is involved in the work and the Father is involved in the work. So why would anybody have any problem being baptized in the name of the Father, Son, the Holy Ghost, in the name of Jesus? Why would anybody have any problem bringing the Father into the per picture? There should be no reason that anyone has a problem bringing the Father into the picture. No one should have a problem recognizing that Jesus is the Son of God. And so understanding that Essential in salvation in the baptism formula, if you would, is the recognition that Jesus is the Son. So baptizing in the name of the Lord Jesus is recognizing that Jesus is the only begotten Son of God. He's the Messiah. He's the Savior. It's recognizing not only the death, burial, and resurrection, it's also recognizing the incarnation. And so all of these things together give to us a complete picture of what's being said. Nothing's being excluded here. Very important for me just to emphasize that. Emphasize that nothing is being excluded; it's all included. It just it's not locked down into some pretty little, you know, nice little package of step one, step two, step three. It's all in the in the name of Jesus Christ by what Christ Jesus has brought to us as the only begotten Son of God, incarnated in the flesh, who suffered, bled, and died, taking our sins in His own body on the tree, buried. And, you know, and then rose again. It's all done in that name. But why should anyone once again have any problem with baptizing in the name of the Son? Hello. Because that's saying you're baptizing in the name of Christ Jesus, who is the only begotten Son of God. Why has anybody got any problem oh, uh, keeping Christ Jesus' formula and keeping it to the full extent, even as he says it to the woman at the, at the will, even as he says it to all of Israel, everyone that is gathered together that day in, in John chapter 7, 
um, at the Feast of Tabernacles, even as he said it in Matthew chapter 28, even as he said it in Mark chapter 16. Why should any of us have any problem with the way that this whole, the whole of what has is said on this subject of including it, because there's nothing here that is contradictory. That's the most important thing. And the context is absolutely certain. It's about salvation. And then, of course, as we then as we move on, and we're going to flesh out that much more on baptism, just to look at the three different categories. But no one should have any problem including everything that is said concerning water baptism, because that once again, there that's the context water baptism, and there are no contradictions in Scripture because it's said by the one and single author, and every bit of it has a message, a breath of insight to bring to us if we're just go, if we're just willing to listen. And so what happened? They believed on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ is really what's being said here when you break this out, okay? They were all baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and you know um you know, when we study baptism, you might begin to say, well, we're not absolutely certain that we're talking about water baptism just by what you see here, but we can be certain by looking at the whole of the scripture that we know we're talking about water here, even though water isn't there. It is part of that same context that we see there um, in Acts chapter 7, verse 37. Forgive me, Acts chapter 8, verse 37. It's that same part of what we were seeing there in Acts chapter 2, verse 38. And so then what happens right after that, the package is totally delivered to them in, in much the same way as it was uh, to the Samaritans. It's just that they didn't have to wait uh, for the gift of the Holy Ghost to, to fall upon them um, by waiting for John and Peter to come down and lay hands on them. Paul was right there. He laid hands on them and the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake it in this language of the Spirit, which is one of the most important um, revelations and indicators of Pentecost outpouring of power, because it's always associated with, from the very beginning, that sets precedence. You can never move away from that precedence. It is the initial evidence of baptism in the Holy Ghost. It certainly isn't the complete evidence. And that's important also, I think, for people to begin to grasp. And I believe it's why F.F. F. Bosworth, who was right there at the, the refreshing that took place on the, on, here, here in Azusa, I got a picture of Pop Seymour up behind me and another guy that was there, uh, that's John G. Lake and his tent right back there. F.F. F. Bosworth was right there in the midst of it. And F.F. F. Bosworth, as one of the originators and founders of the Assemblies of God, ultimately came to the place where he's saying, no, that, you know, the language of the Spirit isn't, isn't the initial evidence and, and I believe that I know why he was saying that and I, I think a part of it just simply you know people were just taking something so deep and sacred and so wonderful and divine and, and making a, a an end all to it uh, the baptism of the Holy Ghost just it, you know it's the initial evidence it's the beginning it's the outpouring of fire but it's so much bigger and broader than that and Paul does spend a lot of time uh, you know, really laying the foundation for this in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, helping us to understand that we excel. There's, there, this is like a gate. This is like an opening up a, of a, of a, of a, uh, of a gate, a water gate, so to speak, you know, um, and not the bad one, the good one, uh, uh, you know, the opening up of those, uh, those floodgates, which is a better way to say it. And, um, an entrance in and a beginning and, and, and the means by which we hook up with the teacher. And I can't get off on that because otherwise I'm not going to get anywhere at all. And, but it, nonetheless, this, you can see that all of the same elements are there in every one. There's believing on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is repentance, believing that he is the son of God. Uh, there is, there's also, you know, water baptism and water baptism that isn't, uh, you know, in any way, excluding what Jesus said. And we're not going to exclude what Jesus said. I don't care what you say. I'm not excluding what Jesus said because number one, it's not contradictory in any way. It's not another tradition. It's not another formula. It's not some, you know, demonic thing that crept into the scripture because I'm going to tell you right now, God's bigger than that. Okay. And so if you're going to say that about one area, then you got to say that about every area. And it's not going to be left up to some group of people or some single person to decide for us what is the word of God and what isn't the word of God. That's nonsense. That's absolutely a 
false presentation of the gospel. There are rules to this. And number one, everything that Jesus said is impossible. Jesus said, anything that I said, every one of my words, it, none of them will pass away. None of them. He, that's it's his, his words. So therefore, what he said about baptism in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, that ain't going to pass away. And it's all in the name of Jesus, okay? It's all in the name of the Lord Jesus. And, and, and what Father's doing is about Jesus. What Holy Ghost is doing is about Jesus. These three agree in one, okay? And I hope that I hope that makes sense. And Okay, so there's more to contrast and compare. You do that on your own. It really helps us to set up one specific point that I think is, is really essential to grasp is this. And that is that even though all of those elements, okay, of... Uh, Believe it on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, being baptized in water and receiving the Holy Ghost is present. They aren't locked in to having to be done in any specific order. Okay. And um, so you can receive the gift, the baptism of the Holy Ghost, gift of the Holy Ghost before you, you know, officially are baptized in water and which is always coupled to believe it on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I hope you can appreciate that. And I hope also that you're really, as you're studying this, you're really beginning to appreciate, wait a minute, you know, it, this isn't two works of grace. People are always trying to say, well, there's two works of grace and try to apply it to what John Wesley said. I'm, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that at all. This is not, I'm not talking about two works of grace. I'm talking about the, the gift of salvation in which we receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, which, which received the spirit of the Lord, because it's not actually phrased that way. You could, you know, it's kind of, you know, it's kind of subtle, but nonetheless, you know, the gift of the Holy Ghost is more associated with the empowerment. So we re at the new birth, we receive the Holy Spirit in such a way and, and the new creation, which allows us now the impartation of the divine nature, which allows us now to live the life of Jesus. And then there is this place of being baptized in the Holy Ghost in which we now are empowered to walk and do the ministry of Jesus, to be witnesses unto his resurrection. And, and you know, Jesus made it very clear that you have to receive this in order to be my witnesses. That you must be endued with power from on high. And that is associated with the gift of the Holy Ghost, just like we see the Apostle Peter associating what happened at Cornelius' house with what took place with the 120, with a special focus on the 11 apostles that were there. And of course, I'm sure uh, the, many others uh, that were with Jesus from the beginning of the 120, they were probably of the 120, they were more than likely they were all with Jesus from the very beginning. And, and, and recognizing that that same event that happened to them there also happened to Cornelius' house and recognizing essentially that as Samaria, truly there it's parsed out for us. They are born again. They receive the spirit of the Lord. They've been, you know, um, they have the Holy Ghost, uh, that life impartation to live the life of Jesus. But yet at the same time, there is another also beautiful empowerment that comes by the same ministry of the Holy Ghost, by the same ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because understand, yes, he is the quickening spirit or the one who gives to us salvation. And also in that particular instance of that verse scripture I quoted from 1 Corinthians 15, he's also the one that brings resurrection of the dead to us. But he's, in addition, what he's highlighted to be is the one who baptizes in the Holy Ghost. And so now what we're going to do is, I know I've run out of time, and I really didn't get to what I said I was going to get to, but this next time around, I'm going to try my very best to do uh, show you how to do a uh, word search and study on baptism. Look at the primary three categories, baptized in water, baptized in the body of Christ, and baptized in the Holy Ghost so that you get those separated and you understand the uniqueness of those and the distinction of those. And then what we're going to do is we're going to deal with the last phrase right here that we want to understand because of what's being said in, these, in this context of uh, Acts chapter 8, especially as it is related in verse 12. What does it mean to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and what are the results of believing on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ? And I'll ask you a question here. If you believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, but you're not baptized in water, are you saved? Do you have to believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, repent, be baptized in water before you're saved? 
Do you have to believe upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, repent, believe on the name of Jesus Christ, be baptized in water, be baptized in the Holy Ghost before you're saved? Does it always have to work like it worked at Cornelius' house? Cornelius' house, because I know that that Bartleman started propagating, and those of you who know, know the name Bartleman, you know who I'm talking to, you know what I'm talking about, uh, that he just basically put it in that category. But hold up, let's get the whole counsel of God because we're gonna, you're gonna have to have just more than one situation. We wanna work from Jesus all the way to the apostles. We wanna work from the gospels to the epistles to understand that and recognize also not only in the gospels and in the epistles, but we can actually turn back into the pages of prophecy and actually hear the same thing being declared to us by the prophets. So it is by many witnesses when Ezekiel says, a new heart and a new spirit will I give you and I will put my spirit on the inside of you. So we have a place, a very place, a safe place to be. So by the next lecture, we're going to be able to wrap this up and then we'll be able to start going into the next part and steps of the final, uh, you know, putting together of our conclusions and hermeneutics by consulting uh, various different commentaries based upon our conclusions, and then apply the rules uh, of hermeneutics towards the end and make sure that all of our conclusions do stand up to those rules. Father bless you. We love all of you. Thanks so much for watching. We want you to be experts, scholars, disciples of the word of God, increase in the knowledge of the Lord and, and, and benefit from it.